I want to, however, continue with this month's theme of Call to Duty. And Jeremy C. Hunt, who is a writer and a commentator for Fox News, is also an active duty U.S. Army officer. And he made this comment uh, just the other day uh, dealing with, uh, and he's a, he's a good Christian man, he, he made this comment the other day uh, talking about Thanksgiving, and, and uh, it's inspired my message, if you will, today. He said this, quote, In the Army, where I have the privilege of serving, there's an unspoken rule that no service member celebrates Thanksgiving alone. If word gets out that a soldier doesn't have a place to go for, ho for the holiday, other soldiers will invite him or her to share a meal and celebrate. Our creed to never leave a fallen comrade isn't just meant for times of war. It's a way of life. All soldiers are reminded that they are members of a tight-knit community, a bond that's becoming increasingly rare in today's society." Unquote. I thought that was an excellent statement. I sometimes wonder why this attitude is not something that we see. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's in the military. It ought to be in the army of God, too. It ought to be in the body of Christ. In fact, it should be even more so in the body of Christ. Uh, I sometimes wonder, uh, you know, the idea of community in our society has permeated too much uh, into the, the, the church. And it has caused a, a decline in our society, and community is not what it used to be. The Pew Research Center has actually nothing to do with a pew. <laughs> but anyway, the Pew Research Center found that only half of Americans, as 52%, could say that they even know most of their own neighbors. I'm thinking that's probably in, in uh, more urban and city areas, but you never know, even true probably around here some. And that data is trouble, troubling to say the least. It, it's still not as noticeable uh, in our area, I don't think as quite as where it would be elsewhere, but uh, we see that Thanksgiving is a time whenever we have the opportunity to buck the trend. It's a time whenever it seems like communities do get together more. And there is more community feeling than, than there is. It's a day where Americans from across every political and social uh, spectrum unite in a common attitude of thanksgiving. And so I want to think about that a little bit as it relates to us. In Mark 2, we find an incident in the life of Jesus that illustrates uh, just uh, what real community should look like and what, it, what it's all about. And also, we can see what Jesus thinks about it. It's over in Mark 2, 1 through 5, where we read, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that, that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I'm sure, I, I, it always cracked me up when I read this incident, because don't you think Jesus had dirt and straw and stuff all over him by that time? I mean, <laughs> you're going to dig a hole in the roof, you know. Uh, but anyway, every day we find ourselves actively engaged in crowds. We all are involved. We're anyone now. Uh, there's all kinds. There's, there's a work crowd. There's a school crowd. There's the, the crowd of associates with activities that, of our children. Uh, you know, there's ball teams. There's ball games. There's, there's all kinds of crowd. And of course, then there's the church crowd. And it's easy to confuse our associations with crowds with having the genuine experience of community. Even the word community means to have all things in common. And most crowds are actually what we could say just pseudo communities, false communities, sadly, sometimes even including church crowds where relationships stay at a superficial level. And, and it doesn't go any deeper than the surface. And, and we may be acquainted with others, but we really don't know one another. 
some crowds don't want to know one another. And they're usually drawn together by certain like activities, external activities, rather than the seeking a relationship with one another, anything deeper than the superficial. People say, how are you doing? And you say, I'm doing fine. Everything's just fine. Everybody's just fine. And usually we don't expect any other answer, do we? I mean, how many times are you, you out on the street and you're downtown or something and you say to somebody, hey, how are you doing? And then they start to tell you. Half hour later you think, why did I ask, you know? We don't really want to know most of the time how a person's actually really doing, but we should, especially in the setting of the church. We don't expect to know that. And that's one reason Americans are more lonely or more isolated than they've ever been, according to Gallup polls. And because of that trend, what we find is lacking of connection with others, lacking connection on a personal level lacking what really community is all about. There are three factors, I think, that, that we can look at this morning that cause the lack of true community, and it will even stun our spiritual growth if we let it. The first one is what we could call consumerism. Materialistic cultures are driven by the goal to spend and to buy and spend. And the promise is that if you buy more, you're going to be happier, you're going to be satisfied. And so many people will try to, to, to feel loneliness and emptiness in their lives by buying things and replacing it with things and, and try to fill that void that way. But it's only temporary fix, and, and as soon as the luster wears off of whatever it is, then they're uh, feeling empty again and looking for the next thing that's new, the next thing they'll buy, anticipating what will bring the next excitement. I, I, if, in effect, most people have been dealing with trying to deal with this on an external basis, and true transformation can ever come from the external. It always comes from the interior. So consumerism, I think, is a, is a false promise that causes people to avoid the real causes of loneliness, the real causes of lack of community in their lives. Another one, I think, is an inhibitor of spiritual growth is individualism. Uh, there's a true rise in, true, in radical individualism in our culture, which is when someone is committed to one's own self. We, we grow more and more selfish and think about ourselves the most. People have come to see themselves as independent. People think, I need no one else. I can do it myself. In fact, isn't that what is considered to be ideal? The rugged, independent American who, who can do it all on their own? The self-made person we hear? How would that translate in the military? It wouldn't. It, it, it goes completely against the idea. And it doesn't in the military, and it doesn't in the body of Christ. Individualism is nowhere found in Scripture. And then I think a third thing that leads to an inhibitor of spiritual growth is the true community is a paralysis of isolation. Many people today want to be personal, private. You couldn't tell that from some of the Facebook pages I've read. But anyway, <laughs> as a general rule, though, Facebook is doing that. You're not personal. You're, on, you're, you're behind something else. And, and you can almost see in that, in the society today, of people that are actually reaching out through that that would not do it personally. And we tend to not want to know anybody on that personal, one-on-one, face-to-face -on -face level. And all addictions, if you'll think about it, occur in isolation. And when I begin to uh, say, it is none of your business, my business is none of your business. I don't need anything from you. I begin to disconnect myself from the hope of ever having any kind of real community. Yet, deep within us all, we are made and created for relationships. 
we have been made that way. And that, that's uh, what, why author uh, Randy Frazee in his book, The Connecting Church, writes this. He says, quote, the experience of real community is one of the key purposes God intended to be fulfilled by the church. God made us to be community, to be in relationships. Paul described it well, I think, over in the 12th chapter of Romans. You go down to the 9th verse of Romans 12 and, and following, he says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. You could almost put that word community in there. Practice community. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. You want a definition of community? It was right there. Some will try to say that they can have a meaningful relationship with God without having uh, a relationship with His body upon this earth, the church. But the church, which is a group of believers, is not just a place to go. It's not just an activity. It's just not something that, that uh, we belong to. It's a community. And it's essential to our spiritual growth and our well-being. Believers in the early church knew they needed each other. And they, they truly, as the church began, were a true community. And, they ex and, and God expected them uh, to be a body. And that's the way they were. They, they had a body life like's not been duplicated since, I don't think. But we see that we need each other. And God expects us to be for each other, with each other, in relationship with each other. And for that reason, we're told in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And let us not giving up. How are we going to, by the way, on 24, how are we, how are we going to spur one another on love and good deeds? Well, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. We do not exist for self. We exist to have relationship with God. We exist to have relationships with one another. Note in the scripture that I read earlier, our, our text is in, in Mark 2 today, that there, there is a contrast between the crowd and the four friends. The crowd was the inhibitors. They were keeping the paralytic man from Jesus. But the true friends, the true community of friends, connected that, that person with Jesus at any cost. At any cost. In our scripture, the para paralyzed man's friends do everything they can to get him to Jesus. We might say, well, boy, those are good friends. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to be. They even tore the roof off the house so he might experience the power and the healing of Jesus. Now, they knew their friend's condition. They knew their friend was paralyzed. They knew their friend was helpless. They knew his struggle in life. They knew his daily pain. They knew his heart's desire to be made whole. And they knew he wasn't able to help himself. And so let me ask you, how many people here today and our assembly today really know you. Really know you. Who is it that knows where you hurt? Where you struggle? Where you are being tempted? And where you need prayer? Larry Crabb, a Christian psychologist, wrote this. He said, quote, a central task of community is to create a place where you can feel safe enough to reveal your most innermost brokenness, unquote. True friends are the people who share and get involved in your life. 
And that helps us to understand the words of Jesus that I shared with you last week, whenever he said, uh, Greater love has no one than this, that to lay down his life for his friends. That's not superficial. That's in depth. And there's no greater love. And that's why so many churches today are actually doing a lot of small groups. And we've gone to a lot of small groups where a small number of people meet often and share their deepest concerns and needs and victories with one another. And that is what real body life is all about. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. That was actually Jesus talking about small groups. Even two or three. It's not about the numbers. It's not about large crowds. In the midst of two or three, we can experience the presence of Jesus in a way that can't be experienced alone and actually can't be experienced in a very large crowd. Because people have a tendency to keep us from Jesus sometimes in a large crowd. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have good churches. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have large churches. That's, 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 that's you know, ridiculous to think that we shouldn't. But the question is, is who is your community? Who's your community? Some, so the question is, where are your stretcher bearers? Or actually, who? Who are your stretcher bearers? Who carries you? Who knows the stuff that goes on in your life that almost no one else knows about you? Who's praying for you right now? Who encourages you, challenges you, and maybe even corrects you? Do, do we have people that we allow to correct us? Who, who as, as we seek to follow Jesus, to follow His way and will, we usually think that Jesus called the twelve disciples for the disciples' sake. To teach and, and to mentor and to teach and establish and therefore, uh, you know, they would begin his church and everything. And he did. Don't misunderstand me. That was important. But while it's true, Jesus also knew that he himself needed support. He himself needed friends. He himself needed carried we see this in the Garden of Gethsemane over Matthew 26, 38, the night before his crucifixion. He took his 11 friends with him and said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I want you to stay here. I want you to keep watch with me. So Jesus, the Son of God, was saying, Fellas, I can't do this alone. I need you. I can't do this, and, and I need you to stand with me. I even need you to carry me through. When he said, keep watch with me, he was asking them to be at watch where the enemy was going to attack. Like a sentry, or like a guard, and like being in a guard tower. And these are the people who are on the first line of the warning of defense when evil begins to attack. These are people who are watching out for one another. That the, so, so that we together can deal with the enemy, just like a good soldier. Can you identify with those people in your life? The ones who are there with you to keep watch, no matter what you need? Notice back in our text in Mark 2, when Jesus said there in the fifth verse of Mark 2, He said, when Jesus saw their faith... Isn't that interesting? Here's the friends come. They bring the paralytic and they lower him down in there. And Jesus says, and it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, my son, your sins are forgiving. You would have thought he'd said whenever they saw his faith. But he said their faith. Whose faith does he see? The paralyzed man? No. It was the faith of those friends which brought him to Jesus, enabled him to be saved, enabled him to be healed. And they truly had the no man left behind idea and thinking that you should have in community. And we see as a good soldier of the Lord, that should be our theme. Such is God's plan for His, His body, the church. So how do we do it? How do we have genuine community in the church? 
Well, there's more than what I'm going to share with you, but, but I, I'm going to just share with you three suggestions today of what we can do to have grow in our community and church. And that is, first of all, get involved. Get involved in, in, in church. Get involved in Sunday school. Get involved in Bible study. Get involved with small group because that is so, so vital. If there doesn't seem to be a place that you feel connected with others, create your own. Create your own small group. And we can help you. We can show you how to start your own small group. And so get involved, first of all. And then I think also, we've done this years ago in the past, and, and I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I, I've dropped the ball. We haven't done it for a long time, but you can do it. Have a prayer partner. Have a prayer. Sometimes real community can begin with one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone in the church that you can share with mutually. Maybe that's where it needs to start with you, one-on-one. -on -one. Meet together over coffee or lunch or talk about each other's needs, real needs, the wants and the victories on a spiritual level. Try meeting with and becoming better acquainted with someone that you maybe don't know that well in the church and are willing to do the same with you and able to sit down with someone to you get to know better so you can become better community. And then I think finally, we got to be honest. We really need to be honest. We need to be open and honest with each other in the body of Christ. It's real easy for a group to become shallow, to be superficial, and not even get below the surface. The most important thing you can do the next time you meet with someone, the next time you meet with a group, is to really reaffirm what it meant to be authentic community together. We need to be people who are carrying each other's burdens. We just read that. Can't do that if we don't know those burdens. Who keep watch on each other's behalf. We can't do that unless we know the temptations of the enemy. Where, where someone's vulnerable to attack who are willing to go below the surface and willing to talk about real things that are going on in their lives, in our lives. And that's what the church is supposed to look like. People who are seeking to put the needs of others uh, ahead of their own. People who, who are thinking as, as servants and ministers, as I've shared in past messages with you, uh, about uh, how we should be caring for one another. And God, we see, is hoping and anticipating that we will catch real, true community. Realistically, you can't get to know everyone equally. There are just, frankly, too many of us. But we're not that big either. But you're just not going to be intimately close to everybody. That's, that's not even realistic to think such. But we see God doesn't expect that. You can connect, though, with people. A few people make it your goal to connect, build them up. God wants us to, to have uh, the, uh, personal relationships that will leave, leave our individualized and isolated lives and be joined together in true community for our own sake and for the sake of the kingdom of God. It will transform your life if you do. That's what I want you to think about as we sing our invitation hymn this morning. I want you to think about these things. I want you to, to, as the army of God, put on the military mind in the army of God and, and be true, real community and leave no one behind. I want you to make that dedication in your mind and your heart and make that a special Thanksgiving pledge. Shall we stand as we sing our invitation here?